its leadership, its management. So it was born out of issues of controls. In accounting, you do a lot of controls, and therefore corporate governance is also an issue of do this, do that. These are the controls. These are the issues to be followed. So um, I am here at CAT. I am your university base. So I want to encourage you to all register so that you get all the benefits and privileges of a registered a student. Uh, now, the simple rules that we are going to follow, when you are not presenting or saying anything, you mute. A BSC, Kwaramba, and others, you need Christy, Dadirai, Chauruka, you need to mute so that we don't hear these other sounds coming from where you are. And you can only unmute if you want to say something. You can say anything you want, you can comment, you can ask a question as we proceed. You can also type your questions so that I can attend to those questions. So that's about it. We are hoping that we are going to have our four lectures. In the past, I've had to do three lectures. They were packed. So I hope that you are all going to enjoy corporate governance and business ethics, or business ethics and corporate governance. Let me now go to the slides. Right, so our, we ask, our first lecture is on introducing corporate governance. Can you all see the slide on the screen? Someone to shout? You are now on mute. I can see it. You are Thank you. you can see it. Thank you. So we are saying a corporate governance must start with an introduction to situate it properly. My contact details are there on the screen. If you have issues, problems, you can just throw an email or you can send a WhatsApp and introduce yourself. Okay, my slide is not moving there. Let me see. Okay, let me restart it. Right. Right. I think the slide, the slide is now moving. Uh, now we must start by situating corporate governance. We want to define what corporate governance is. Um, this is premised to be the panacea to survival of an organization. We are saying. It is an assumption that where there is corporate governance, where there are best practices, an organization is a chance of survival. That's why here in Zimbabwe, companies are pushed to uphold good corporate governance practices. And that's why we also have a corporate governance code for Zimbabwe specifically. That's why for our state-owned enterprises, also called parastatals, we also have a code that deals with 
parastatals. Now, Western countries, Far Eastern countries, are far advanced in terms of the development and implementation of corporate governance codes. But Africa, while we do have these codes, but we are lagging far behind. Our, our own code, for example, we got it in 2015. So late. But however, for corporate governance practices, Zimbabwe cannot be said is lagging behind. Even before we got our own code in 2015, we were using the Companies Act, Chapter 2403. Now we have what is called a what is called COBE, a corporate business. Okay, I don't know the new the new name of that Companies Act, uh, but now we have a new Companies Act. But in the near past, we are talking of 2020 going before. We were using the Companies Act because it has certain provisions that say, for example, every company must have a board. Every board must meet, say, quarterly and things like that. So those are the things that also apply to corporate governance. Now we also have codes like the South African Code. They are usually called the King Code because the guy who was inspirational in making sure that the a code came into being was called Adrian King. So the code is called I'm, I'm King sorry, Code. Bro. Hello, can you hear me? Um, Yes, I can hear you. Uh, may you please record this session? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, I don't know if it's possible, maybe if you could uh, stop your video since it would also uh, help us save one. Okay, let me remove the video. You are quite right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So it is the King One code which came into being in 1994. Then we have another King 2, King 3, now we are at King 4. Then in the UK, you know we have historical ties, our former colonizer. They started with the Cadbury Code. This was the first effort of coding corporate governance based practices in 1992. Then 1994, South Africa came up with its own King 1 Code. Many other countries then followed. Now the UK is far advanced, I think more advanced than any country as far as I know. And the UK is, come, is what is called the combined code on corporate governance, which means after 1994, when they started with their, King, their Cadbury code, they then had many other episodes of codes, like the Smith code, the uh, Greenberry code, and many, many others. And the good things about each code, you know, were then combined to form what is now called the combined code on corporate governance. So it's a combination of many codes from the same country. Then 2015, we now talk of our own code, whose short form is Zim code, but the full form is Zimbabwe National Code on Corporate Governance. Um, those of you who are registered, can see an attachment of that code. But if you want, you can Google Zimbabwe National Code on Corporate Governance, you can get it. But we face quite a lot of dilemmas or confusions when we talk about corporate governance. Is corporate governance only to be practiced by corporates? Because the term says corporate governance. So corporate is a company, governance, that's how a company is run. Therefore, are we only talking about how companies are run here? What of other organizations which are not companies? When we talk of companies, we are talking of the deltas of this world, Econet, etc., etc. So where is corporate governance practiced? Can corporate governance be practiced in parastatals? Right, the word parastatal is like a Zimbabwean uh, term. When you go to other countries or type parastatals in Google, you might not find a much about this. This word is a creation 
which could have come from countries like socialist countries like Russia. In most countries, parastatals like Tel One, Net One, Ada, Zimra, NASA, they are called state owned enterprises. Your universities also fall under the same category. So, are we saying state owned enterprises should also practice corporate governance? Are we saying our own ministries, Minister of Finance, Minister of Higher and Teacher Education, etc., should they also practice corporate governance? Because the term says corporate governance, which means company governance. Ministries are not companies. Do NGOs require corporate governance? NGOs are not companies. Can it be practiced in schools, universities, colleges? So is the term relevant to all sectors where we have a gathering of people? Or is it a cliche of our time? The word cliche means a way, something that has changed its meaning because of passage of time or, or, or abuse or misuse. So are we abusing the term corporate governance to mean But we are saying essentially corporate governance is practiced by anybody, by anyone, even when you go to your own homes. Uh, in your own homes, you must have order. Somebody must know about the finances. Somebody must know about sharing family meetings, deciding where you are going to go on holiday, what crops you are going to grow this year, and things like that, what you are going to have for dinner, you must, when you gather and discuss these things, it's more like also you are practicing corporate governance. So basically it's about how you put order or governance or leadership where there is a gathering of people. You want order. Now, is corporate governance new to Zimbabwe? When I was doing my thesis uh, for PhD, I argued that this is not new to Zimbabwe. Even before 2015 or far before when we started this issue of companies, corporate governance had already uh, had some footprints in Zimbabwe through the DARE or the chief's board or chief's court, chief's gathering. The chief, the chief would have some advisors who could be his sacrunus or the headman. Whenever there was a problem, the chief would gather those wise men. And an issue uh, could then be discussed. So corporate governance didn't start with the coming of the wise. Corporate governance started a long time ago with the traditional governance system. So the mission of the DARE is to promote harmony, sharing of ideas, settling of disputes, sharing resources like Minda, proceeds of Zundera Mambo, setting standards of engagement with Gamitemo and giving counsel to the chief. So basically what we are saying is that corporate governance leadership order did it start now it has always been there so what is corporate governance in terms of uh, definition the word corporate governance is derived from latin it means gabbe which means to steer like to drive so corporate governance is like driving a company The traditional definition of corporate governance, I'm saying traditional there because that was the first, first definition crafted by uh, the Cadbury report of the UK in 1992. It says it is a system by which companies are directed and controlled. This is a system by which companies are directed and controlled. So when you are directing a company, think of directors who must be there, a board of directors. 
but the directors are not there day to day therefore it means there is somebody who should be controlling and uh, the control is done by the ceo or the managers who come on a daily basis so what we are saying is that a company must be directed and controlled that's about what is corporate governance systems there are other definitions that then came up i do have my own definitions now if you want to know about your lecture you can go to google scholar when you go to google scholar there are quite a number of publications the journal articles that i've written you can quote some of them when you are writing assignments actually i've written a lot over 30 publications including books and book chapters so just type obex file on google scholar you'll see what i've done you can do the same if you want to know what your lecturers have done so you 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 can you can type their names and then something can come up what they've done so same Wang and Shou have said that corporate governance is a set of mechanisms that affect how a corporation is operated and that it deals with the welfare and the goals of all stakeholders including shareholders management board of directors leader, lenders regulators and the economy basically Wang and Shou are trying to say corporate governance is anything that must bring together that must produce results that will make a, a, a quarter of people happy, like stakeholders, shareholders, management, employees, everybody. That which must happen to make things work and make people happy is corporate governance. This is a very recent definition. Then we have Brennan and Solomon, a, systems, a system of checks and balances, both internal and external, which ensure that companies discharge their accountability to all their stakeholders. and act in a socially responsible manner when they are carrying out their activities. So you can see this is a definition coming from somebody who is from an accounting background. Checks and balances, this is from accounts, from audit, both internal and external to come back. So quite a number of definitions can come up, but the basic idea is that in corporate governance, you must make sure that there are controls, somebody's overseeing them and implementing them for the good of the majority called stakeholders. Then we have a definition from Mila and Triana that this is the determination of the resource deployment and conflict resolution among the diverse interests of organizational stakeholders. So you can see, we are, what we are trying to say is, in corporate governance, it has to do with resource deployment and the resources are people, financial, information, you know, material. So these have to be deployed equitably so that interests of organizational stakeholders are brought to bear and performance is measured or performance happens to satisfy those stakeholders. So we do have quite a number of those definitions, but the traditional earliest, traditional and earliest definition is a system by which Companies are directed and controlled. So when you get time, just go through those definitions to try to understand what this is about. But now, there are some misconceptions that arise because of uh, corporate governance. Uh, when people try to understand the wrong thing or think of the wrong thing, some people would think when we talk of corporate governance, we are talking of management. Now, corporate governance is beyond management. It's more than that. But now, there are some misconceptions that we must get rid of here. 
when you see those two triangles, one is broad at the base, then it becomes narrow as it goes up. Then the other triangle is broad at the top. The other triangle is broad at the top. It narrows and, and meets the other uh, triangle, which is broad at the base. What this is simply implying is that we have two groups of people in a company setup. The first group at the bottom, this is management. They are doing day-to-day -day work. They do the operational issues, right? They are selling, buying, manufacturing, and doing all of those things. So as we go up, management becomes leaner and leaner, and they are making high-level decisions. But they will then meet the board. The board now is in charge of mostly what we then call corporate governance. What we're basically saying here is about accountability and supervision. The board supervises management at the bottom there. The board is not for day-to-day -day governance, but the board comes periodically, usually it's every quarter. So for January, February, March, the board will come in April to review the performance of the first quarter. April, May, June, they will come in July to review performance of that second quarter and on. They just come periodically, not all the time. So the incidence of conversion between the board and management is that small, a four-sided shape, which means the board does not have to uh, subjugate management too much. The influence of the board is little. But management there at the best is the one that does much of the work. Management is what they do much of the work. So management, which is being done by that in that white triangle, the, the, the unshaded triangle, that's not corporate governance. But when we now bring in the board doing its oversight on what is being done by management, we call that corporate governance. That incidence of conversion, of working together, of assigning roles to management, uh, you know, monitoring, advising, that's we call, that's what we call corporate governance. The strategic management, the executive there or management must propose the performance that they think should happen. Then the board will have oversight and say, this is what you need this is where you need to reach so that's about strategic management it means ideas coming from the executive and ideas coming from uh, the board both meet to form the strategy the strategy belongs to the board it is implemented by management so you need to understand those three principles corporate governance corporate management and strategic management and strategic management is the course that you are doing so strategic management is the course you are doing so you are learning how to implement or deal with strategic issues so you are no longer going to be people who are going to be played around with you are going to be dealing with strategic issues my operational issues yes day-to-day -day supervising those who are manufacturing who are selling who are doing this but we are preparing you to the corporate leaders who will be in charge of strategic management in an organization Co corporate governance is not the same as financial management they are totally different financial management is actually done by you know the cfo chief finance officer the right that's the one that will do you know your financial management it's an accounting kind of thing corporate governance is broader it looks at resource deployment oversight of management you know assigning of tasks to management giving them advice ruling them offside doing a busy you know at top level that's corporate governance so financial management is just one task of management then corporate governance is not the same as corporate social responsibility ethics now those two other terms are just subsets of corporate governance 
in corporate governance, you need ethics. In corporate governance, you need corporate social responsibility. This is uh, what other companies do. For example, when uh, Nyarazo provides a service to you, they will give you a tree to plant so that that tree will give you shed. Delta will sponsor your sports and you enjoy your sports. You know, that's corporate social responsibility. It's part of just corporate governance. But in itself, it's not corporate governance. It's just, it is just a part of or a component of. So this animal we are calling corporate governance, what is its genesis or how did it evolve? How did it come about? Genesis is about Malambo, the starting of something. So how did corporate governance evolve? Now, this is a typical example question. So we are not going to have a, a lecture on uh, tutorials. We are going to be tutoring each other as we proceed. I will be asking a typical exam questions. You will find out that when you go to past exam papers, when you go to past exam papers, you will find some of a question of the questions similar to this. How did corporate governance evolve? Now, I wouldn't ask this question this way because it's open-ended. The question that I would ask is, any five uh, reasons why corporate governance evolved so that you are limited to those five responses? It can't be open-ended. So you, we are now going into the next part where we'll talk about the evolution of corporate governance. What are those things that precipitated the coming into place of corporate governance? Uh, who benefits from corporate governance best practices? Already, you, you must have some you know, intuition to say, Corporate governance is beneficial to these groups of people. One is it would be shareholders because they want the company to run properly to, to earn some profits or benefits, rewards. It would be the managers themselves. If the company is run properly, they get benefits, etc. So the employees, a properly run company won't close, then they will continue working, earning benefits. Uh, is corporate survival possible without corporate governance? Discuss. I don't know what you're going to say after the end of the following slides, whether a company can survive without or, uh, caring about corporate governance. So let's now proceed to the next part. So it must be going after the part we are going on your own, go backwards, find out if you are able to answer uh, these questions. Now, in our studies, when you are writing an assignment, when you are writing, for example, even a literature review for your research, it can be next year or the year or two, two when you are in uh, data analytics. We use what is called a final approach. In a final approach, we look at what happened at the world stage. Then we come back to Africa, and we then finally come back to Zimbabwe. That's the final approach. We go to the wider world, we come to Africa, we then come to Zimbabwe. So we are going to explore the world cases of corporate failure, those cases that have happened to precipitate the coming into being of corporate governance. In the whole world, then we'll come back to Africa, we'll come back to Zimbabwe. The first case we are going to talk about is Worldcom. This is a USA company in 2002. This a phone and communication company used improper accounting policies to misallocate 3.8 billion. You can imagine our own budget, Zimbabwe's own budget is about 3.8 billion US dollars. 3.8 billion US dollars. 
So one, just one company, its executives colluded to misallocate through accounting policies 3.8 billion. What they did was that they played around with expense accounts. You know, you have your revenues there in your income statement, less the expenses to get your net profit. So they got some net profit, including 3.8 billion. Then they took the 3.8 billion and used it to pay, you know, bonuses, pay, things like that. And you know what would happen later was that if a company like this reported a huge profit, what would happen was that the following day, you know, people would be rushing to buy shares of this company. But then those companies that this fund would get borrowed from will also come to say, pay us. That's where problems start. Because this company would be having a hole, right? Not this, we will be having nothing like this 3.8 billion. The incomes will just be misstated, the profits. Therefore, this company can't pay its creditors. So, those creditors are the ones who, who say, who told regulators to say this company was lying about its profit and a, an audit or a re audit was done and certified that indeed this company was broke. Its chairman borrowed 408 million. You can imagine. With 408 million being lent to one person. And you, you know, in Zimbabwe, it's not allowed for the chairman or any board member to borrow from the company where they are a board member. Because it's a breach of best practices. Who is going to approve the loan? Because all people are junior to you. The CEO reports to the board. Therefore, the CEO can't approve the I mean loans for the board. So this is bad corporate governance which happened here, leading to the collapse of this company. One, they falsified the accounts using improper accounting policies. Two, they had some borrowings that had no collateral. Then the company collapsed. So corporate governance now comes in to put some controls. Don't lend money to your board members. Uh, use proper accounting policies. It strengthen audit, audit committees must meet, you know, things like that. No corporate governance here. Then another case is the case of a company called Enron. You can also Google on your own, find out exactly what happened to these companies in detail. You know, this was an energy company, you know, phone and energy companies are always very big all over the world. Think of Econet. A net one till one. So Enron was all an energy company, Zesa, your Zesa in the USA, very big company. So this one also misstated its earnings and assets. It's like taking your those who do accounting. You know, you would understand what I'm talking about. You talk, you take your expenses, you classify them as assets. It means your profits will be huge. Then you take those profits and you pretend you have made money. You start sharing among yourself as bonuses. You even declare dividends to pay to your shareholders. You are actually digging a, a war in your pockets. You see, when you are at a loss, you don't give out dividends. Even when you make profits, sometimes you want to plow back into future business. So in this company, also executives paid themselves huge bonuses, also earned billions of dollars selling company shares given to them as part of their remuneration package. So a lot of chicaner was taking place here. So this company eventually went bankrupt. Uh, and I would ask, with the you people who do big data analytics, you people now would do strategic management. This is your place where you do the numbers and you tell all and sundry that no, we can't have bonuses. You can't pay dividends. These profits are not right. So you must listen to your audit, internal audit and external audit to put things right. So these companies, in one case, if you learn of a company called Maxwell, it's an audit company. They actually tore in their audit reports. They bent them. 
shredded them to hide the evidence. So corporate governance is about transparency, is about doing your things arm's length, ethically. That's why this course also is a synonym called ethics. A bank called Barings in the UK. What happened was very funny. A guy called Nick Leeson was very intelligent. So he was doing investments for this bank. You know, banks make money through interests. So he was investing your money, your and my money. Right? People borrowing it, earning a lot and lot of what? Interest. Then this guy, because of his capabilities, was uh, promoted to another post. But once he was promoted, they forgot to take away the responsibility of investments. So he took a lot of money from the bank to the Singapore Stock Exchange. And then it was a very bad time. And the value of the shares dropped, which means part of the investment was eaten away by that drop in the value of shares. So 1.4 billion was lost. You can imagine this is about a quarter of Zimbabwe's own budget of a whole year, but this is just one bank. So with its 233-year-old history, this bank sank. So if you people do data analytics or strategic management were there, you were going to pick it. So you are going to be very pivotal in the companies that you are superintending of. Then a company called Pamalat, you know, this is a company that does milk and milk products. It's an Italian company. You know, in Italy, they have, you know, some crooks, quite a lot of crooks who do underworld businesses, including, you know, even presidents, the last, one of the last presidents, Berlusconi, he had a lot of scandals, business scandals, corruption, sinking of companies. So there is strong collusion between board members. There was strong collusion between board members, top managers and top politicians who helped each other to the company's resources. And the board was just looking aside, it was getting huge benefits. So the board was just looking aside. And what was lost? was 1.5 billion euro you know they overstated revenue by 1.5 billion what this means is per top line and line re income statement of the revenue right if you add 1.5 billion on top of the true revenue it means your profit will also be overstated by 1.5 billion then then it means you are publishing false information you are making it appear like you made huge profits yet you didn't and auditors as well participated in this scandal so auditors should be the eyes and ears of the board that's why in the board there is a, an audit committee that must meet every quarter look at audit reports and give advice on how to strengthen controls So those are some of the few uh, international cases, world stage cases, but they're quite a number. If you Google the world cases of corruption and corporate failures, I would have quite a number of them, lots and lots of them. But now coming back to Africa, uh, are we together? Can someone shout yes? Hello. Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Right, you can go alone. Thank you very much. Now we come back to Africa uh, with our final approach. Uh, this neighboring country of ours called South Africa is a scandal region, especially with the uh, you know state owned enterprises. There is one called Lijanet. It's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a company that runs the transport system in South Africa. SABC, South African Airways, quite a number of companies. If you Google, 
failure of board oversight, like in the case of Lijanet, leading to failure by joy. You know, one company had two CEOs, you can imagine. Who do the, I mean, people listen to, the board listen to. So it means there can be some factions there. So this company surprisingly had two board members. I mean, two CEOs. And also, the board chairman failed to disclose an interest he had in a gym that was then purchased by the same company. This is called conflict of interest, a huge issue in corporate governance. You need to disclose your interest in anything. You can't go to, or suppose you are the CEO of K or K and a board member somewhere. You must disclose that you, that uh, OK. So that if your company wants to transact with the OK, it means that disclosure will help. Otherwise, people will do things to your company without knowledge, and you benefit and fail. Then we go to Nigeria. I think you know, you know Nigeria is well known for, I think things are now better, but there used to be a lot of corruption leading to corporate failure. Uh, those companies, Lion of Africa, MTEL, Kaduna, Textiles, Nigerian Airways, Concord Group, HITV. You know, failure of the board to monitor inside the trading, granting unsecured debts or loans, granting of loans to friends and relatives without due process. Inside the trading, in a situation where you know, you know something, um about your company your company is going to make huge profits so you go and tell your sisters brothers go and buy shares there so that you will make huge profits that's called insider trading you know something inside the company so you go and tell others to benefit and fail so in insider trading you try by all means to avoid it that's where corruption starts some people will not disclose something about a company they are tied to. They will actually push the company they are working for to go and buy from their family company or companies of friends and relatives, you know, that kind of thing. It's called insider trading or also conflict of interest. Right, uh, no. there are quite a lot of cases in Africa. I will just give some examples. Now, let's look at Zimbabwean cases. In Zimbabwe, if we were doing this face to face, we were going to be enjoying you giving me examples. But in this kind of a scenario, we don't want to waste much time because you lose your data. There are quite a number of frauds perpetrated by companies in Zimbabwe leading to corporate failure. Some companies folded forever. Some were then resuscitated, you know, things like that. Air Zimbabwe, for example, this is a company which I would describe as one that is comatose. It's almost like as good as dead. Fraud of over 5 million in 2014 by management in an insurance scam where the insured aircraft was not even bought. What of the four Malaysian planes purchased? Who purchased for who? And one of the planes was labeled a RGM4, something like that, at the tail. You know, the, these things, you all read about them. You can Google and find out yourselves. Then we have Pismas 2014. The CEO offered himself a salary of 500,000 per month without board approval. But of course, some would say there was board approval. But was that approval legal? Half a million US dollars. If it was you getting that one per month, you would buy 10 houses. But somebody was getting all that per month from a company that was uh, teetering to the brink of collapse Christmas. Then uh, ZBT 2014. The CEO and manager approved their own benefits without the approval of the board. The CEO earned 40,000 instead of 50,000 per month. These things are not from my head. They are in the newspapers. These are the things that will make a company face difficulties in operations. You can imagine where one person is getting 48,000 US dollars. 
and you are a company that is that has a social perspective tied to it it's not that very much profit oriented yeah so these are some of the things that can bring a company to its knees Right, then we have companies like African Renaissance Bank, once led by a guy called uh, Patterson Timber. You know, he would uh, lend money to friends, former classmates, and fail to get it back. There was a weak board overruled by the executive. In fact, uh, he was the executive chairman many of us go CEO and chairman. We are going to learn later what is called um, duality, where the chairman of the board is also the CEO. So the CEO is employed through the chairman, the, through the board, shared by that chairman. So if you are both, what's going to happen with the issue of oversight? executive the chairman. The same fatality uh, was at the CBA, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, during the time of Gideon Gono. He was an executive, uh, like CEO. He was the Reserve Bank uh, governor and also the chairman of that board. That was very fatal. It shouldn't happen in a company because it reduces oversight. Then the uh, Rainbow Tourism Group, it did not collapse, but there were a lot of bottom squabbles, fights. You know, one of the shareholders, a white man called Nick Van Hook, threatened imposing board members. You know, board members should be elected by shareholders at an annual general meeting. But this guy, a white man, very powerful, very rich, he would pick board members from out there and put them into the board. So there was a lot of turmoil, turbulence eh, around the uh, 2008, but now there is some stability at RTG. Then we have David White Limited. I know it's a company that is under what is called judicial management. A judicial manager is appointed to run this company to bring it to a good operational what, performances. This Judicial manager must lift this company out of the doldrums. So this company had ineffective boards, uh, leading to corrupt, collapse, failure to follow internal controls, and, and it leading to company retrenching staff, and it's now under curatorship where a judicial manager is running it. So most of these you can tell are a result of poor corporate governance choices. So now, we want to look at the evolution of corporate governance. That first question which, we, which I asked, how did corporate governance evolve? Meaning, how did it start? Because this term corporate governance, when you Google it, it doesn't start from afar. It's a term that started in the 90s. That's when it became so popular, in the 90s. Yes, in the well, period before 1992, other terms were used in place of corporate governance. But the term corporate governance, as common as it is now, is not very old. It's about 30 years old. So how did corporate governance evolve or how did it start? Now, there are some major, major corporate governance developments that took place. First one was uh, the coming in of the Cadbury Report in 1992, the Cadbury Report in 1992 was followed by one called in South Africa in 1994. So I can safely say South Africa was far advanced than most countries in the world in terms of corporate governance compliance. It could be that uh, South Africa gained its independence in 1994, the same year 
that the King One code came into being. Now I can we can talk of King Four. They are using King Four, and they are talking of starting King Five. Now they are starting King Five. You know, so some of these developments precipitated the emergence of corporate governance. Uh, this popularized corporate governance. There is an organization called Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, it's a group of countries, developed countries. In 1999, they came up with their own code. Because, you know, you can be Britain, but you are operating in uh, Russia, in, the, in, in, in South Africa, in Brazil. Is uh, you know rich country, so they thought of having a common court so that when you go to another country to operate from there, you are not learning new things. You already know the expectations. Then we have the Sabans Oxy Act. This one is the USA Corporate Governance Court. This is the code of the USA. Now, what they did was that when Enron collapsed in 2001, followed by the collapse of Worldcom and many other big, big companies, it shook the USA a corporate market. Then government took a decision to say, we need to come up with rules and regulations that will make corporate governance possible and our companies survive. So a guy called Sabans and another called Oxley, you know, these must have been members of parliament, you know, from Congress. So these two were tasked to come up with a, a team which would be broken down into committees that looked into various issues of what we now call corporate governance. So they were tasked with coming up with corporate governance mechanisms that would make companies survive. Like our Zimbabwe National Code on Corporate Governance, the Zim Code of 2015, which we have, which I said you can Google and get it from the net. The US, yes, theirs, which is called the Saban Sox Act. In short, they call it Sox. Right, so that one came into being in 2002 to look into those issues that had made companies fail and other best practices. But now, what made this one a more pivotal and a serious act was that uh, this one became their companies act. They took the whole companies act and merged it with corporate governance best practices. Now, one major feature of SOCS is that Every company in the USA, in the USA must have a department that looks into corporate governance compliance. It's like the audit, what the company is doing in terms of corporate governance implementation. Because if you fail to implement corporate governance best practices in the USA, you are penalized. It's just like here in Zimbabwe, if you are a listed company on the stock exchange and you fail to abide by certain provisions or expectations, you are penalized. Now, we started talking about the Cadbury report of UK 1992. Then in, in 2003, we got the combined code, which was a, a combination of a series of other researches to improve that Cadbury code of 1992. So the separate, we had various codes like Smith Report, Greenberry Report, Ampel Report, were then combined to form this combined code. It's a combination of, co of separate other research uh, efforts. And OECD again uh, had other succeeding or preceding codes to improve what they had. And uh, South Africa, King 1, King 2, King 3, King 4, now they are working on King 5. Uh, then Zim code is, is what we have, which was approved for implementation in 2015. 
So these efforts were very pivotal in ensuring that corporate governance is imprinted in our company setups. Right, so I've already explained uh, the Cadbury report named after, say, Adrian Cadbury, who was given the task of looking into best practices. And then he presented this report to, to, to Parliament in the UK. And Zimbabwe has copied a lot from this one. I remember when I was studying corporate governance, when I was doing CIS, we were using the Cadbury report to get to know provisions in the Cadbury report. They form the best. Anywhere else, this one is the best. Then in the UK, again, I said we had a Greenberry report. Its findings were that directors' remuneration packages must be disclosed in the annual report. Pano publisher, my company is by by the financials. There should be lines to say our directors had the following earnings in the year, and they should be named one by one. The chairman, Mr. So so, earned so many, so much in terms of board fees. So so earned this much. So, so all of them, their earnings must be there. Together with the earnings of management, the CEO, finance director, director HR marketing that they all must be there with their total earnings so disclosure in annual reports it came from a suggestion which came from greenberry to say this is a way to limit theft because if you are going to disclose then it means people must not try to get what is not due to them Then uh, the combined code, okay, it was a combination. There was also a 10 bull report in 1999. And uh, down there we have Smith report. And each report would come up with recommendations. Like the Smith report recommended that audit committees should be taken with seriousness. Every company must have an audit committee, not only finance committees. In the past, it used to be finance and audit committee. It used to be finance and audit. So it was realized that people who are looking into budgets, expenditures, procurement of assets and stores cannot be the same people looking into issues of audit. These committees had to be separated. And also audit committees had to have, and they still should have, people who are totally independent from the executives of the company. Otherwise, when wrong things are noted by auditors, they would just say, uh, they would just maybe tear the reports, like what happened with Maxwell and other, you know, other very famous uh, corporate governance failure cases. Yes, Hans Oxley, I've already talked about it. It's a USA, uh, you know, that's their corporate governance code. But this one is an act. So it means whether you like it or not, you have to abide by it. And you have to form a department to look into compliance issues, which will be treated the same way as a procurement department these days, as a finance department, HR department, marketing department. So you have a corporate governance compliance department. And the failure to comply comes with penalties. So there was that question, how did corporate governance evolve? So the following are some of the responses. Corporate scandals, problems, failures, breaches, shenanigans, thefts, corruption perpetrated by people in leadership and boards in collusion. Cases like, you know, when you are like in an exam setting, you are justifying the emergence of corporate governance. If you want to give examples, you can't just give, let's say, five examples from the West, Europe and USA. You also may need, you say you give two in the West, two in Africa, 
and true in Zimbabwe, it shows that you understand. Not just lump everything to one area. You have to have a geographical spread. That's what we call the, the funnel approach. So those companies are examples of companies that failed and they are spread in the world, west, back to Zimbabwe. So those failures precipitated the writing of codes. A management running away from the vision, you know, managers must execute programs that are in the strategic plan and the strategic plan is approved by the board. It's a plan of the board executed by management. So sometimes management will want to override the board and do things outside the ambit of the board. Now that is what we call the agency problem. There is a theory we are going to look at called the agency theory, where on one side we have the agent, who is the employee, the manager, the agent. Then on the other side we have the principal, who is the shareholder or the owner of the company. So the manager always wants to do his things, wants to do things that will make him any more money, uh, with having to do less. Whereas the principal wants more profits, dividends, and the like. So we have a problem called the agency problem here. So management must be controlled so that management will not run away with the ball. Then also what brought about corporate governance, trusting management to a point where you just go and rest and say, I know management will bring profits, will bring benefits, but why did management itself not form its own companies to run? Therefore, any board called management cannot be trusted. There should otherwise be oversight. This stewardship theory is similar to, if you go to Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 30, where we know of the stewardship theory. You know, the, 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 we, we have that, uh, issue where you know a landlord wants to go away he calls his three employees first employees he says i am giving you five talents second one two third one one then on coming back because this guy the, the, this shareholder the owner the landlord trusted all three he was happy when the one with the five gave him five more the one with the two gave him two more and the one with the one is the untrusted kind of guy with the agency problem at the top. He said, no, 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 I could not have end something for you because you just want to eat where you did not sow. You, rip, you want to rip where you didn't sow. Therefore, I dug it underground. Here is your talent. But of course, those are the, the two were good stewards, trusted management who gave the owner 100% more profit but is this what is happening in our companies so corporate governance comes in to make sure that shareholders are trusted if they are not trusted still the board oversees and tries to reduce cases of poor management or thefts corruption and things like that another justification of evolution of corporate governance it was the idea to make sure that all stakeholders are satisfied are happy and our stakeholders, our managers, employees, shareholders, government itself. If companies are run properly, government earns a lot of money through taxes. These people are employed and government also earns, pays you earn from them. Those people then pay to NASA and when they are old, they are looked after by those, you know, pension investments, things like that. So what we are basically saying is, these are some of the things that led to the evolution of corporate governance. It ensures that stakeholders are satisfied. Then, satisfying the wider world, environmental theory there. When you are mining, you don't want to just dig around, leave pits, you don't reclaim them. You want to reclaim the environment because it will be used later. You have exhausted what is underground, but the top part still should be in use. 
So that's what is uh, important for this corporate governance. This has led to its emergence. When you are running a company, you want to ask yourself, am I not destroying the environment? Am I using cyanide, dropping it into rivers? What's going to happen to cattle downstream? Are they not going to suffer the consequences? So corporate governance tries to limit head to the environment and the people or those who benefit from it. Risk mitigation. With corporate governance, you mitigate against the risk. You reduce the risk. Because corporate governance says you must have a risk committee. Uh, that risk committee will inform the board, and the board then oversees what uh, the management is doing, so that there is risk mitigation. And you have, through that, you avoid corporate scandal. Scandals, you avoid fraud. You avoid civil and criminal liability because you are bringing those things up and therefore you want to pursue them, try to avoid them. You put in place all things that will make sure that you avoid them. It enhances a company's image. That's another reason. If you ask me in Zimbabwe which companies are run very well, I will tell you that Go to Econet, you will be impressed. Go to Delta, you will be, you will be impressed. But uh, from those companies that we've talked about, our own you know, state-owned enterprises, they are the culprits, major culprits. You can tell how they are performing, whether they are doing well or enhancing their own images. You can tell. So good corporate governance enhances a company's image like the examples i've given you of delta econet i think you have your own other examples that you can cite it also dictates a shared philosophy same thinking you know practices and culture you do one thing as a company if you are following the best practices of corporate governance it also keeps a company out of trouble because you are following those best practices Corporate governance is a checklist that says the board should meet quarterly. It must have committees, for example, audit committee, risk committee, finance committee. And those committees are looking at reports and things like that. So, it, so corporate governance keeps a company honest and out of trouble because there is oversight from the board and its committees. Dishonest and unethical dealings can cause shareholders to flee out of fear and distrust. distrust. So when you are doing well, you want to pump your money in Econet, in Delta, in that other company where you know it won't fold and you lose your money. There are some companies which are very risky and you know them. You wouldn't put your money, you wouldn't put your money there. Because and many, many other reasons why we need corporate governance. It helps in better oversight and accountability, improved decision-making, better compliance and less conflict, less self-dealing, we have already talked about, insider trading, where you know information, you are then going to inform others to say, you people you are connected with, we have a tender, very lucrative, do A, B, C if you want to win it. And then you are given a cut at the back, that is not good. Business must be an arm's length kind of thing where everybody is dealing on the same wavelength with the same information. So also corporate governance leads to better informed decisions and it avoids costly litigation through adherence to laws and regulations. Because your board will ask you, you want to build something there. Have you done an environmental impact assessment? Then you say, oh, yes, this is the report. Is council coming to, to see, to, to more like approve stage by stage? Yes, these are the stage forms. Did you do this, this, this? Yes, this is the proof. Did you do that? No, we didn't do it. Then you are heralded. So corporate governance does those things to avoid falling into legal traps that might lead to difficulties and corporate failure 
So you can see that there are too many, many reasons why corporate governance evolved. So in an exam kind of setting, I would just want you to articulate any five reasons. And if you are somebody who would have studied, this is one question that can make you a very happy person, whether it's an assignment or an exam. It also helps in improving access to capital markets as well. A well-run company is access to capital. A well-run company is susceptible to getting this capital, I mean, access to capital markets because they are transparent, accessible, efficient, this there, timeliness is there, completeness, everything that is good is there. You know? So what we have said is corporate governance came from somewhere and we have reasons. The major one being corporate failure. When companies failed, corporate governance came in as a solution. And then these are the good things that corporate governance makes companies uh, survive. Right, typical exam questions, apart from those first three, that I think by now you must be able to answer. Discuss what motivated the emergence of corporate governance cause the world over. What motivated the coming up of those codes? It's like companies were operating with no rules, with no reference point. Therefore, these reference points called codes were more like a reminder to say, ah, you need to do this, ah, you need to do this, ah, you need to do that. Then discuss sources of corporate governance in Zimbabwe. Right? The corporate governance did not just emerge from nowhere. One of the sources that we've already said it is the Companies Act. One of the sources is the Companies Act. Another source, other codes, like the South African code called King Codes. We have the UK codes called Combined Codes, but the initial one was the Cadbury Code of 1992. You know, and many, many other publications that spell out best practices that companies should hook up with to avoid failure or collapse. So you can articulate them there. But when I ask questions like this, I would not just throw like, I would give a limit to say any three sources at the top there, discuss any five reasons that motivated the emergence of corporate governance uh, cause the world over. Then the last question, discuss contributions of South Africa and the UK to the Zimbabwean corporate governance landscape. You then narrate uh, the development of those codes. You narrate the developments of the codes. And uh, this, I think, uh, brings us to the end of our first part. Um, so this is our slide one, which introduces you to corporate governance. You know, let me now go to the public chat. The last one says, what happened with the Barbican Bank? Ah, well, you know, our finance minister was the brainchild it was the best out of our finance minister. Uh, they were selling what are called financial instruments. And then the whole thing collapsed. And when this whole thing collapsed, you know, there was some disappearance of somebody and then featured back. So we are saying these things collapsed. And they can collapse. And one suspicion is that maybe the boards the board was weak. But you know, poor business can also make a comp company collapse where even when good governance is there. So sometimes we don't want to assume things. But if you read over the reports that were coming, they can make you uh, come up with something. If you read those reports, they can make you come up with something and arrive at a conclusion. And also the same happened to Trust Bank and Royal Bank. In fact, the Trust and Royal 
they are accused of venturing into non-core businesses. Trust, for example, would buy refrigerators, would go to Wilder and buy, buy all bricks uh, using Marizal Bena. It's hoping that when people were buying those bricks, they would be buying at huge, huge prices. But then the whole financial system collapsed and the, the money was tied in vehicles, bricks, and, you know, things like refrigerators. So it was non-core business that they engaged with. So when you are in corporate governance, we encourage you to focus on core business. When you are doing your reports, they will, the board would ask, can you split your major income streams? Then they will see sale of refrigerators, sale of bricks. Then they'll say, ah, does a bank sell refrigerators or bricks or motor vehicles? So that's a breach of corporate governance best practices. Right. Uh, those are the questions I've seen. Okay, Zimbabwe is another example of a company with good, exactly, okay, Zimbabwe, rightly so, I will agree with you. Best practices are practiced there and it's a very successful company. And uh, okay, is, okay is, uh, you know, related to Delta, if I'm not mistaken. Delta has some shares there. Um, let me see if I have any other question. Right, someone, is say, someone said, can you share the presentation so that we can download it? Right, those who are registered, the presentations are on your portals, but I also sent all the slides to your uh, class rep, reps. I think they've, I sent them through email. I also sent them through up they can share with you right then i was stuck when we were talking about the one source of our corporate governance the new companies act the COBE. the full name is companies and other business entities act so this is now a, an act that encompasses all types of companies i saw the COBE, but it's it is a separate chapter from 2403 uh, our old companies act um right somebody said record the lecture record the lecture which i've done let me see the last question how is zim code enforced what measures are taken on those who fall thank you very much that's an important question to students who are learning like yourselves now zim code um, is not enforced you know this kind of way you breach and you are taken to the cleaners or you pay a penalty zim code is a kind of a, a code which they say you must comply or explain meaning that you must comply with it but when you fail to comply with the zim code you must explain why you failed to comply we are going to do a slide that talks about types of codes. That's where you understand it better. But our state-owned enterprises, they have their own code. You know, the Public Entities Corporate Governance Act, Ananasa Zimra, Chichi, Nanakati, Wama University, we have a code, you know, the Public Entities Corporate Governance Act, which came into being in 20, uh, it must be 2018. Now, this act that act must be followed every line item must be everything that is in compliable in it it must be complied with right so you really need to comply with everything in it public entities corporate governance act and it also cites our zim code to say when you are a public entity you must also comply with the zim code but the truth about zim code is that is that it's not like a, the USA code, the Sabans Oxley Act, which is a comply or else kind of thing, where you do you really have to comply with everything. So with a, this Zim code of ours, it's best practices that you have to comply with. But when you fail, you just inform the readers why. Right then. Like Samuel Beta saying, other regulatory authorities like the Arabizet have their own. 
Yes, the Basel Committee Best Practice Frameworks, these are used for banks. Basel Committee Frameworks are for banks. So when you go to RBZ or any bank, they have their own code of best practices. Now, uh, thank you very much for the discussion we've had and the comments you have put there. Now, let's go to, I want to remove this and we'll go to the second slide. Are foreign-based companies forced to enforce ZIM code? Yes, they have to, because that's, those are best practices in Zimbabwe. But there are no penalties. When you report, you must report that you are following everything. But when you fail to report, you just explain. For example, the issue of disclosure of benefits earned by the board and the you know, executive. When you fail to disclose, you just let members know or readers know why you are not disclosing that maybe it could be a court order or something right made of what's inside it that makes it so exciting we first talk of uh, principles of corporate governance what are those things that we hear people talking about all the time people talk of accountability People talk of fairness, they talk of transparency. People talk of independence, reliability. Therefore, let's now go one by one. Fairness, what is fairness? You know, every company must practice fairness. Even in universities, we are told you do not have to show any favor, ID, facts, issues. You must always be coming out, publishing true facts and showing the world what you have and what you have accomplished. You have to show the world what you have accomplished and what you are doing. So this is a framework that should ensure that timely and accurate disclosure is made on all material matters. So to be transparent, it means you have to disclose. And mainly you are disclosing your financial situation, your performance, your ownership, earnings of your executives, earnings of your board, and even the governance structure. Where you are going, according to your strategy, you also need to disclose. That's transparency. If at your mind, there's been an accident that has killed people, don't hide it. Otherwise, there are some way who can help you. So it means you have to be transparent. And then accountability, it means anything that happens, good or bad, you are accountable to it. Don't push it in other people's corner. The corporate governance framework and the strategic guidance of the company the effective monitoring of management by the board and the board accountability to company and shareholders. Being free from influence, you are being accountable and you avoid conflict of interest. So you must account for everything that is happening. And you must also be independent. When you are accountable, you are showing independence. It means it's not somebody who is saying, do this, do that. You are doing things because they have to be done. And you are the CEO, you are our manager who has to do ABC. And you have to be accountable for your actions. And you perform because 
you want to show your independence. No one is influencing you to do what you have to be doing. Right, so you can have a typical exam question, explain the four pillars of corporate governance. So those pillars, there are five of them. You must be able to ex just explain what they say, what they are about, and how they build corporate governance, why they are pivotal to corporate governance, why they are the building blocks or pillars. You can see that structure is in the form of a house. So if you don't have those pillars, then your building collapses. So those are the pillars of corporate governance. When, when there is a lack of any one of those, the corporate governance is bad, right? What are some of the key structures of corporate governance? We'll start talking about the board. The board of directors is a group of people appointed to serve as a think tank for the organization. And that board debates, I said, advises. It is a board of people who are independent professionals and they are honest in manner and deed. People who have seen it all. People who have exercised similar board membership elsewhere or they are people who have been CEOs elsewhere. Right. So what are, what are the roles of the board? All board members must be on the same page. Their role is to run the organization with the same frame of mind and they should be sharing a similar vision for the future of the company. Must provide oversight function. They are like the referee. They will tell the CEO, you have gone wrong. Your performance is way, way off the line, off the mark. You've managed 30% instead of 100%. You, you are not following a risk procedures. You are not following your budget. So they have the, an oversight function. They provide guidance because they've seen it all and they are experts. You know, a board is full of people who are lawyers. You need a lawyer, you need an HR person, you, you need an accounting person uh, or an auditing person. They are just one. Accounting and auditing is one thing. Uh, you need an, maybe a technical person in terms of engineering. Maybe your business would need one person of that nature. You know, so those various forms of expertise. You need a data analyst. And your CEO or other managers, or I mean, those other board members must have strategic thinking, which is what you are training in doing corporate governance or in doing MSc in strategic management, in doing data analytics. So we are preparing you for the board. Whether is so, we have two parties. Uh, the manager knows about profitability in the company. He can then inform relatives, friends to buy shares and make money or can phone them to say, ah, bring also your, t your quotations. We have tendered for ABC. Your bids must be below this level, you know, things like that. That is conflict of interest, but also conflict of interest can arise in your performance. You are performing because you want ABC as a manager and also the shareholders or owners they will not give you what you are worth because they want more to remain and they want to be rich. So conflict of interest, you must be able to explain this one. Now, second theory, a stewardship theory. This is the theory with an example in Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30, which I talked about the parable of the stewards the parable of the talents a manager the owner the shareholder gives three of his employees talents five two and one the one who got five made five more one who got two made two more this manager was happy he said i'm going to give you what you are worth 
right? Then this one, we had one, we hid it under the ground. So it coming. So this one is a paid manager who got one and gave back the owner one. He is like the uh, somebody who falls under the agent's theory. Somebody who must be pushed to work. So stewardship theory assumes that management knows the need to produce profits for owners and also needs no monitoring. They work for the greater good of stakeholders. That's the, those are the assumptions of the stewardship theory. Managers are good people. They, are making, they want to make money for the owners of the company. They will only be satisfied in getting what they are worth. If they work very hard, they also they just get better returns. If they don't work hard, they don't get as much. So stewardship theory assumes that managers are good, whereas the agency theory invokes boards to always be on the lookout of the performance or the doings of managers, which are which are assumed to be on the wrong side. Then our final theory, we, we are only going to talk about three theories. There are many, many other theories. There are many, many other theories. But we will just zoom in on these three. Before we talk about the stakeholder theory, we will say, who are the stakeholders of a company? Who are the stakeholders of a company? Now, 10 marks, for you to answer this question in an orderly manner, you first need to indicate, you first need to indicate internal stakeholders, then external stakeholders. Internal, these are like management, you know, staff, even the board itself, shareholders, these are the internals, right? Shareholders can also qualify to be under externals. Even these other, you know, members of the board, they qualify to be both because they are working with you both inside and outside. Then you have external stakeholders, shareholders, creditors, or your, creditors are your suppliers. We have customers. We have your government and these agents like Zimra, NASA. Competitors are also your stakeholders. Your enemies are your stakeholders. Right? So, what does your stakeholder theory say? It says the business of a company is to make sure that every stakeholder, both internal and external, is satisfied by the dealings in the company. So the stakeholder theory also takes from stewardship theory. It pushes management and also the board to work to satisfy the broader, the broader stakeholders. Yes? Uh, on our side, is still showing slide nine, agent theory. OK, also it's, it's OK. OK, yeah, it changed now to, to, to the Okay, so we are, oh, that's fine. So you need to define stakeholders and classify them as internal and external. It will show order. You know, when I am marking your work, you must have a pen and paper as I am speaking now. When I give you an assignment or the exam in your final, I want work which is structured. I don't want just acres and acres of space that are just written like a form one composition. What you must have is at the top, you must write introduction. You underline the word introduction. You then write that introduction. Then you definition of terms. If there are terms you think need to be defined, like in stakeholder theory there, like what is the, the question is, who are the stakeholders of a company? So you need to define the word stakeholder. It's a key word there. Then you now go to the board where you are now writing subheadings. You now write subheadings. For example, you can write internal stakeholders. 
then you go one by one, skipping lines, you know, paragraphing, so that as I mark, it's easy for me to, to know this paragraph is an issue, this paragraph is an issue, paragraph is an issue. Then you go to internal, external stakeholders, you underline, this is part of your body as well, but you don't write the word body. You underline and you explain stakeholder by stakeholder there. Then you write conclusion, right? Then you write conclusion and you conclude. Now, if it's an assignment, you now then write references and you list your references. But in an exam, I don't want anybody to write references. That would be lying. You will not remember because you will be under stress. An exam is a stressful experience. So you are not going to write references. So I want to believe you have understood what I've said. I want work which is structured. Unless it's a short answer type question like explain managerial entrenchment, that one is just one paragraph. But if it's like a, a long, longish type question like this one, an exam question or it is what um, an assignment question, you need to structure it. If you don't structure it, I will mark it. But the incidences of me not marking everything, picking every point, because I will be marking a lot of scripts. So when it's a structured, it's easy for me to pick the points. And then we are now continuing with our structure of the board. I mean, types of boards. There are basically two types. We have the unitary board, which is the, the one that we have here in Zimbabwe. We just have one board, the board of directors. Sometimes uh, in school setups, they call it the board of governors or board of trustees. It is still just a board. But when you go to Scandinavian countries, when you go to Germany, France, I suppose, they have what they call the dual board. So in a dual board system, they have the supervisory board, which is elected by your shareholders. The board, which is like in our unitary system, in this system, it is called the supervisor board. Then we have a management board, right? We have a management board, which is employed by the supervisor board. You know, if you take, for example, huge, huge corporates, like in Germany, in Japan, China, you will have in other parts of the world, people called presidents. Those presidents, are basically like your CEOs. We have a president in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, in Chagut, Chagut. So those presidents are your manager, your CEOs. They will form their own board where they will be reporting their performances. And then their performances are combined to then form what will be presented to the supervisory board, which is the board elected by shareholders, our, like our normal board. So I want you to understand that one. Where it happens, this management board is a board of top, top people, the CEOs, who are most, mostly called presidents of divisions in various countries. If you take, for example, NESO, NESO is in many countries, so you would have presidents. But com com companies like Delta have a similar thing. They would have... Um, you know, president for for Africa, president for Middle East, president for what, what, and those will become to form this management board. They are all like uh, CEOs, big CEOs. They are CEOs in their countries, but then they, they, there is somebody on top of those CEOs overseeing a bigger region. Those ones will form their own board, yet they are also employees. So you need to understand these two types of uh, boards. Right, so composition of the board. Your, your boards must be composed of uh, 
diverse people of diverse backgrounds uh, and your boards must really represent key stakeholders must comprise experienced stewards experienced stewards to mean uh, next line there you must have qualified technocrats accountants hr practitioners legal experts engineers you must have every profession you need so that those professionals will be will have a bearing on the things being presented by the executives you can't for example have an audit committee when where, where nobody has an audit experience or accounting experience that would be a poor committee finance committee would need accountants there because they will know how to compile budgets right so it goes on like that risk committee would need maybe somebody who has the economics experience accounting experience somebody who understand issues of risk it goes on and on like that so you need to experience the stewards you can also have them um, people diversity in terms of age age diversity you don't want to have people who are in their 60s you also want people who are youngish in their late okay 30s late 20s 30s 40s who are young in the budget still we are talking about the architecture of corporate governance now types of directors i am fond of asking an exam question on this there are four types of directors i am fond of asking the first one is the executive director now this one you know this is the ceo cfo and other internal directors as long as they are sitting in the board sometimes you have the hr director who is not sitting on the board so that one is not a director is the title can be director you know this title director can mislead you we can have a sports director who is somebody very very low down there but in this case we are saying we can have many directors in a company like the chief executive officers chief finance officer human resources director a marketing director but those who sit on the board those internal directors who sit on the board no announce ma executive directors like ceo cfo usually these two but in some companies they are only taking the ceo the cfo is there not as a member but is there in attendance to explain the reports and answer questions then the we now have those outside directors who are named given different names so the common name for any outside director is non executive director in short form these are called nets these are called nets non executive directors nets in short so a non executive director is not executive a non executive director is not executive so is somebody who comes every quarter to deliberate on the business in the board jano is non executive so when you come to the setting of a board you can have let's say 9 10 members up to 12 sometimes and in that one there will be only two one or two executive directors the rest the majority 80 90% are non executive they come from outside but now corporate governance is also saying that those non executives must be independent of the internals what this means is that a uh, the no internal executive directors should have an influence on the non executives there should be no collusion there should be no collusion between these two groups of people the executives and non executives otherwise there will be what is called conflict of interest
Then independent directors, there are those outsiders or non-executives who are totally independent. They have never worked for the company, never supplied. They don't have any internal member they know. And so these are totally independent. Maybe you are bringing them because they are lawyers. Maybe you are bringing them in. Maybe you are bringing them in because they have expertise like accountants, marketing directors. Then finally, we have what are called uh, alternate directors. This, these are like direct those directors who come in when one non-executive maybe is not well, is going outside the country, or some director has resigned suddenly. So this alternate director will just uh, fill the gap. He's just picked by the other directors to fill the gap until there is a formal appointment of another director or until that other director who just went outside the country comes back. So this one is a temporary kind of director because all directors must be put onto the board by shareholders or owners of the company. So this one is put on the board by other board members. So it's, it's not kind of a real director because directors are nominated and put into place by the owners or shareholders. So in short, the, also that the board should be balanced with the majority. And, and uh, the last line, their CEO results in managerial in, employee entrenchment. Yes, managerial entrenchment. It means the manager has unfettered powers. Uh, no one can raise a voice against the manager. So this is one fatality about duality. Right, then um, we look at, finally, we'll, this will be our last slide, a board interlocks. Now, board interlocks or interlocking directorships, this is where a director is a board member of many companies whose directors also sit on his boards, you know. People are, see, are meeting in one board and going to the other, they are coming to your board, those interlocking directorships. In Zimbabwe, we support, we, we purport or appear to have a small pool of non-executive directors. Thus, we reuse the same available directors. Uh, it, it's a fatality. There are people like myself here, yeah, I'm an expert in these things, but I sit on a certain voluntary boards and not boards of these corporates. Maybe you as my students, if your companies are looking for boards, you know your lecturers, pick one or two from your capable lecturers to sit on your boards there. They will help your companies. Like myself, I will help your company. I write, I talk, I evaluate, I do ABC. So not to have so many people intermingling. Let's say for five, five people, you are meeting another five boards with them. This is called interlocking directorships. It's a, it has its advantages, but the majority are disadvantages because one advantage is that, yes, you can cross-pollinate ideas, pick ideas from wherever you are interlocking with others. You can also move with the times by learning from others. But in most of these cases, there is a lot of stealing of ideas. Ideas you have learned from one company, you take them to a company doing similar things. Um, promoting inefficiency because you are not thinking, you are just taking ideas that have already been thought by others. You give them to other companies. And you know, there are quite a number of you know, disadvantages. So there is need for an optimum number of board members which ensures good utilization of the human capital that is resident in your needs. So the non-executive directors must have human capital which must be utilized or exploited by uh, these companies. 
So I think for today, we have uh, covered quite a lot. Uh, go through what we've covered and also extend to the last slide, which is number 33. So tomorrow we'll pick from slide number 19 and, and continue. So you can have your... Okay, let, let me just have a look at your charts there. Um, let, okay, let me see the questions. Um, right, hands on, I'm saying I'm a dualit. Uh, so it means with your friends, you are picking each other, leaving out some people who can actually add value. Uh, you do you are doing the same kind of thing. You have a big, big company, but uh, you are just linking with people that you know. Drop some of them and pick people you don't really know who just come to add value. Is it permissible to sit on more than seven boards in Zimbabwe? Well, the, the average number of boards where that you can sit is uh, something like three, according to the Zimbabwe National Code of Corporate Governance, our Zim code. But if you go to the code that governs our state-owned enterprises, our parastatals like um, like CAT, NASA, Zimra, it says maximum two. It says your maximum is two. But uh, I'm surprised, even though we say maximum is two, there are quite a number of people I know who sit in NASA and that other board, that other board, that same state owned enterprises, three or four. So we need to improve on that. Because if you just rely on the same people, they are busy people, they will not exert all their energies in your work. But if somebody is sitting on two, maybe maximum three boards, they will give you their best. They will give you their best. Then there is this other. Okay, these are the main issues. Why is Zimcode not becoming an act? Yeah, I think as you as as we start corporate governance to entrench it in ourselves, we don't start the hard way. If we start the hard way, it becomes one painful. Uh, besides being painful, it will also not be that very welcome. So you, you start slowly until there is such a time that it is it has sunk into people's heads, they understand it. That's when you are saying, let's make it an act. But also an act comes with its own costs. I have said you form a company, you, you form a department that oversees or audits how you are implementing corporate governance. So that's about it. I think I will entertain the last one. Why is Imcode not becoming a... Oh no, sorry. There is someone, Samuel Beta is typing. I think that will be the last... Cost of compliance are an issue. Yes, yes, that's true. Cost of compliance are an issue, but still, compliance in itself will save you here and there. Once you start complying, then you save yourself from failure and other things. But still, cost compliance brings with it some costs. Then Liz says, is there a ratio for women to men sitting on a board? Yes, a, a lot of research has taken place. I have actually written a paper. You can Google and look for a paper on women board members where my research gives credence to the prevalence of women on boards because they have certain characteristics that uh, improve performance of the board. Uh, because when you look at corporate failure and collapse throughout the whole world, including in Zimbabwe, there is not even a single company that is run by a woman that collapsed. Because women have certain characteristics 
that make them uh, look after companies the way they would look after their own children or homes. They don't want to make companies collapse because tomorrow they want to go to the same company. But men want fast money, a quick back, and they will do all forms of things to earn a quick back. But whereas women will not do that. Women are not risk takers like men. The women, most women are risk averse. Whereas men are risk takers. Therefore, 84 of you have logged in. I want to believe I have uh, people from data analytics, from strategic management, and those who are not for this group, you are taking advantage, it's good. So tomorrow we meet again. Thank you very much and have a good evening so you can close the session. <laughs>